everyone, this is Al Fadi and I'd like to welcome you to a brand new series of videos that we will be uh, making here under the umbrella of political Islam. This time we are going to focus on the topic of slavery in Islam. With me here in studio, my dear friend and uh, our brother here, Dr. Bill Warner. Bill, welcome back, and thank you for agreeing to join us again to talk about such a difficult topic. Well, actually, the reason I do it is you and I have fun discussing this. Amen. So, Bill, um, slavery in Islam is, in and of itself, just the topic or the title is troubling. Yes. And especially in, in an age that we're living in, where people are becoming more and more hypersensitive to anything that is historical, you know. I mean, we, we, we see the topic of reprobation in the U.S., you know, about things that happened in the past, actually. You right. Know, we're not, like, happening right now, or, or things that were not even ordained, for instance, by any religious authority. They were done just by men. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to slavery in Islam, um, you, you've done some research on that, you know. Yes. W share some of the things that you came across yourself. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm asking you, as a Westerner, of course, because I want to show people who are Westerners or not uh, Arab speakers how easy it is to uncover things like this. Well, I spent eight years teaching at basically a black university. And one of the things that I noticed was is they knew nothing about slavery except they were very sensitive to it. The theory was is that evil white men on wooden ships went into Africa and brought back slaves to bring to America. <clears throat> There's some truth to this, but it's not nearly this whole story because it turns out it's impossible for this to work this way. The, the ship sailors are not in the business of being slavers, they're in the business of sailing ships, and so they stopped in Africa to pick up the slaves who were already in slave pens. That is, this was a business transaction. Well, how did the slaves get into those pens? Well, this is the thing we want to talk about because it turns out that there were over 11 million slaves that were brought in from the west coast of Africa, and for every slave that wound up being on the plantation, five more died before that. Because That's right. there's a lot of collateral damage in collecting slaves. But I found that at this university there was a complete lack of ignorance about the nature of slavery, that is, that Muslims sold the slave to the white man. I was listening to an interview on NPR, and they were beginning to at least discuss the subject of slavery, and to agree that, well, it was African tribes who captured other Africans to sell them to the white man. We're getting closer, right? But we're not there, nor did we actually get there, because it turns out that the reason they were there was this was a process of jihad that collected the slaves, and they had very good doctrinal reasons for doing this. Muhammad was a slave owner. He was a slaver. He gave slaves away as presents. He wholesaled them. He retailed them. He had sex with them. And so Muhammad was deeply involved in the business of slaving. And he also made money on them. Mm -hmm. When he killed the Jews in Medina, the women who were left were wholesaled off to be sex slaves. So slavery is very much a part of Islam. Now in the book on Sharia, the, like the way of the traveler, they like to blow this aside and say, well, no. Actually what they say is, is that Islam treats a slave much better than what you're used to. Mm -hmm. That is, slavery was almost a job you'd apply for on Craigslist if it were offered but no one actually takes that job up. I wonder why. I wonder why. The ignorance can be seen, one of the most famous athletes in America was a man by the name of Muhammad Ali, but that was his new name. His old name was Cassius Clay. Now what's interesting is that Cassius Clay was a white man who was an abolitionist. He fought for this freedom of slavery. And what did Cassius Clay take as his new name? Muhammad Ali. Muhammad was a slave trader and Ali was a slave trader. The reason this is important is is I have no objection to what a man wants to call himself, but at least you need to know the origins of it. And so you took off the name, the white abolitionist and put on the cloak of the black slaver. So I think that we need to understand this because you may say, well, what's this is just all of the history, Bill. Wrong. Go to your, web, go to your browser and just look up this, modern slavery Africa. Some estimates are there's as many as nine million slaves being held in Africa today. This is important. I think it's also important that we understand history in the correct manner. That is, I don't say that the white men involved in this trade were any good, but I do say that the ones who put the business together were not any better than they were. We need to understand something else, is that we think of slavery in America as being black slaves. Well, there were Hindu slaves, there were uh, 
white slaves. There were all manner of slaves. And again, I don't blame Muhammad for being a slave trader because in his time and position, this was possible. That is, it was part of the culture. But we come back to this thing called the Sunnah, which is Muhammad is the perfect example of the perfect life. And so if he was a slave trader and had slaves, then why can't any other Muslim have it? That's right. So we have here that Allah ordained slavery. As a matter of fact, one of the things you mentioned earlier in the Hadith, which was that if a, slavery, if a slave tries to escape, that's bad. His prayers won't be, if you try to escape from your master, your prayers won't be heard. And what was the only way out of this slavery? If you converted to Islam, there was a possibility that you might be freed. But, unless you convert, but if you didn't convert, you would not be freed. So there's a whole business of slavery within the Islam, and it goes off into more details, which you can cover later. But the fact is, Islam and slavery are like this. They're bound up with each other. Even the poetic language, Muhammad's father was Abd Abdullah. Abd is slave, slave of Allah. That's right. So even being a slave is viewed as the best way to live your life. And Muhammad uh, always said, you know, don't, don't praise me or consider me to be special. I'm just a slave of Allah. Basically. Exactly. And in, in other words, uh, uh, he's, it's almost like pacifying the term slave here. You know, it's like, you know, it's a good virtue right. to be a slave. But, you know, again, I come back to if it's such a virtuous thing and such a good thing, how come you can't just put an ad in the paper? Wanted, slaves, apply. That's true. It doesn't happen. And, you know, let, let's talk about, does the Quran even endorse something like that? So, uh, chapter 33, verse 50 of the Quran says, Prophet, we have made lawful to you the wives to whom you have granted dowries and the slave girls whom God has given you as booty, as reward in war, of course. Or maybe you end up over taken a tribe or something like that. You mentioned the story about the Jewish tribe, for instance, where the men uh, were literally annihilated, killed, yep. and now you're left with the woman, and the woman now become kind of like a, uh, you know, a product to sell and earn money off of them. Well, they did earn money. It turned a handsome profit. Yeah, absolutely. Now, now I, I know what somebody's going to say. They're going to say, well, wait a minute. You know, you go to New Testament, it's talking about slaves. True, it's talking about slaves. Those were slaves that were enslaved by the Romans, for instance, and others. If you are under that kind of a system and you come to Christ, the Bible kind of encourages you to stay patient. The Lord will bring basically a solution to that. Nowhere are you going to find Jesus or the apostles saying, I want you to go, and if you collect women, make them slaves. Or if you collect people uh, from different nations, make slaves. He didn't say, go and make uh, slaves. He said, go and make disciples. Here, it says the following. We have made lawful to you. And if any Muslim is honest about, uh, about the Quran, this is an open-ended permission that applies until today. Mm -hmm. Because the Quran is eternal. The Sunnah is eternal, that is the actions of Muhammad. So this is not just something that happened in the past. It is something that is forever a way to do business Absolutely. or a way to lead your life. Absolutely. And this one, by the way, came from chapter 33, verse 50. Chapter 23, verse 5 said the following, except with their wives and slave girls for these are lawful to them. What is that talking about? The verse basically uh, in context talks about that Muslim males are allowed to have sexual relationships basically with their wives and slave girls. They cannot have it outside of marriage, but if they're married, which is expected to have sexual relationship with your wife and your slave girls, which mean you're not married to her. Remember, you own her and therefore her body belongs to you. There's something interesting, by the way, about this, which is that if you're captured and you have a husband, since Muslims are forbidden to have sex with another man's wife, when you're captured, you're automatically divorced. That's right. That's right. And the scripture indeed talks about the fact that even if a slave, like you said, before she was captured, was a married person, by virtue of being a slave now, you can kiss your marriage goodbye because... You're no longer obligated to that marriage, but now you're mine. I decide what to do mm -hmm. with you. 
And this is the kind of teaching that are found in the Quran in many chapters. You know, you go to chapter 4, verse 92, 5, verse 89, 58, verse 3, and the list can go on and on and on. All that to say is that this idea that Islam came to elevate the status of woman, uh, I'm not so sure really what polite word I need to use to say this is nothing but hogwash, okay? It is hogwash. There is no founding for it. I appreciate the fact that somebody feels uncomfortable about the teaching and try to come up with ways to at least justify that it was something in the past or whatever. No, we're talking about the Quran that if you are telling me the Quran applies to the past, then you're saying the Quran can be changed. Find me a reasonable Quranic scholar that will agree with you. You won't find anyone. You won't find anyone anywhere. And if you find them, make mm. sure they issue a public fatwa. And let's see what happens if they do something like that. Yeah, so. So one of the things I found interesting about slavery was is that it was so integrated into Islamic society, I was, gave myself a little project of putting together all of the Arabic words that refer to slavery, and uh, which was an interesting list to make. And I was interested in doing this basically on what I call the snowflake or the snow theory. It is said that Eskimos have a hundred words for snow. And of course we have one, maybe two or three. Hmm. And the reason that it's important is the Eskimos deal with snow all the time. So therefore they have a highly sophisticated language for that. So I went through the Arabic language dictionary and found out that there were over 40 different words for slave. What does that tell me? It was totally integrated into society and it was highly developed. I noted there were words that said escaped slave male, escaped slave female, and escaped child slave. Right. So all of these things say to me that it was very much a part of the society. It was very sophisticated. And again, I think we need to study this not from the standpoint of history, but from the standpoint of it's here today. That's the reason there's slaves in Africa yet to this day, and more are being taken. That's correct. That's correct. Well, um, this is obviously a deep topic, so I'd like for us to visit it back again mm -hmm. in the next show, and uh, we'll continue to explore together what does the primary sources, the trilogy, if you wish, teach about this topic. And we're gonna really pick you know, examples and give you references, and we'll see how long this will take us. But technically speaking, this is a topic that deserves to be given attention. I know myself and Dr. J. Smith did a number of those, uh, you know, episodes on this particular topic, and we talked about the trade, you know, uh, the slave trade, basically, and this idea that it's Western Westerners versus uh, Muslims, for instance, and we covered all of that. But here, we want to revisit it one more time, myself and Dr. Bill Warner, and now we want to show you also other references from the Quran and the Hadith that endorses slavery and it really has no regard in terms of women being married, women being young, uh, and so on and so forth. So until we meet again, hang tight. Lord bless you. Thank you for watching. Please like our video, and we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Sierra International, and be sure also to click the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we upload new videos into the channel. And finally, I like to prayerfully encourage you to become a patron through Patreon. Your giving is much needed and will enable us to produce more and more of videos like this so that we can publish them on a weekly basis. So thank you in advance.